Journey Through the Night, Volume 1, Into the Darkness. Chapter 1. A thrush was singing, singing with persistence and passion. There, on that branch outside the window, as John sat up in bed, the thrush screeched and flew away. John yawned, rubbed his eyes, and looked across the fields. The sun stood just above the pines. A slender wisp of fog still hung above the ditch beyond the meadow. John smiled. How beautiful it was out here. They had moved from the town of Zeist three days ago, three hectic days. He and Tricia, his 14-year-old sister, had worked late last night helping their parents get the house in order. At 11 o'clock, he had staggered upstairs dead tired, but mother and father had worked on. No wonder they were still sleeping. I know what, he thought. I'll surprise them. I'll bring them a cup of tea in bed. Jumping up, he almost tripped over a stack of books. He splashed a little water on himself and pulled on his clothes. Those books belonged in the bookcase. The corner beside the bed would be a good spot to hang his air rifle. Beside it, at a slight angle, he would put his Indonesian spear. And his judo emblem would look just right between them. It was his prized possession. He wasn't even 16 yet, and he had come a long way. The best in the class. If only he could keep up his lessons in one of the nearby towns. But now the tea. He stopped at the window. Three farmers were standing on the road, and one of them was talking loudly, pointing to the sky, waving his arms, pounding his fist in the palm of his hand. John couldn't catch the garbled, angry words. He smiled and shook his head. Farmers do get steamed up, he thought. Then he glided quietly down the stairs into the kitchen and put on the water. When he entered his parents' bedroom with a tray of tea and rusk, his mother and father were still fast asleep. They looked young to John, hardly his parents, and suddenly he hated to wake them. But in the end, he put down his tray and shook his father's shoulder. Dad! Mom! His mother opened her eyes first and looked around, bewildered. Then she laughed. Whew, she said, I was in the middle of a dream. What time is it? You have only to listen, your highness, and you'll hear the whistle from the creamery, said John, bowing deeply, which means that it's exactly seven o'clock. He sat down on the foot of the bed with his own cup of tea. "'Shouldn't you call Trisha, too?' asked Mother. "'She's already sitting in bed drinking her tea,' answered John. "'She was a lot easier to wake up than you two. "'I only knocked once and she popped right up. "'How do you like it? "'Don't I brew a great cup of tea?' <laughs> "'They laughed and nodded. "'What were you dreaming about?' Father asked. You were hollering, no, 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 and you almost kicked me out of bed. Mother laughed. First tell me, where in the Bible does it say, if someone would kill you, do not defend yourself, for the unrighteous man will kill his own soul. I woke up with that text in mind. Isn't that strange? Yes, it sure is, said Father. Especially since there's no such text in the Bible. If someone would kill you, do not defend yourself. That would be a text to tickle the pacifists. Johnny boy, that mother of yours sure wakes up with weighty matters on her mind. It must be because I slept so deeply, said mother thoughtfully. Today we won't have to work so late. We got quite a bit done yesterday. Here's my cup, John. I'm going for a walk in the woods, said John, stacking cups and saucers on the tray. It's beautiful outside. Just listen to the birds. Wait for me, said Father. 
He jumped out of bed, slid into his slippers, and grabbed his housecoat. Surely you're not going out like that, asked Mother. Why not? That's the nice thing about living in the country. You can go out dressed like this without offending anybody. After the two had strolled through the orchard, bright with pear and apple blossoms, John's father stopped and looked back. John understood. He was admiring the house he had designed and built. He had reason to be proud. The low white house with its thatched roof lay concealed among the trees, blending naturally with the landscape and the neighboring farmhouses. John's father was an architect, and this house was the fulfillment of a dream. He had come back to live where he had been born, among the farmers with whom he had grown up. Now he could devote himself completely to his favorite work, designing country homes in the old Saxon style, but with modern interiors. The chill of night had lingered under the canopy of the trees. It was good to walk into the sun. As father stepped around the windbreak, which divided the orchard from the pasture, his eyebrows lifted. Amazing, he muttered. That's amazing. Look, John. It's Harm Barrels and Fred Bauman walking together. They live right next door to each other, but the families have been feuding for 15 years, and here they come, walking together like the best of friends. The two farmers slowly drew closer, each leading a couple of cows. Deeply engrossed in conversation, they glanced up at the sky every so often. Suddenly, coming face to face with John and his father, they started visibly. Who are you? one of them muttered. What are you doing here? He clenched both hands on his walking stick. Father laughed. What a friendly welcome, Fred! Don't you know your old classmate any more, Averett de Boer? We moved here just a few days ago. Averett? It is Averett, cried the other, reaching for father's hand. Man, you've changed. And this is your son? He's almost a man already. I took you both for Germans. Go on, said father, laughing. You're joking. Germans? Why Germans? Well, why not? said Harm Barrel, shaking their hands. It's not impossible, is it? Now that we're at war. The laughter died on father's lips. At war? He repeated slowly. Yes, haven't you heard? Said Harm. Didn't you hear all those planes? They passed over in swarms with the first light of morning. Huge black airplanes heading west. And didn't you hear the explosions? Our soldiers blowing up bridges but it won't do much good. The Germans will be here in a couple of hours. That's why we're taking our cows home. Oh, Lord, exclaimed father. And then John was frightened. His father did not swear. Suddenly he was running to keep up with him, running home through the undergrowth. Together they burst into the kitchen. The radio! gasped father, rushing into the living room to turn it on. You listen for the news while I go tell mother what's happening. My boy, my boy, it's terrible. Those miserable traitors, that confounded Hitler. Still breathing hard, John sat tensely near the radio. When they had listened to the news last night, there hadn't been a black cloud on the horizon. Lately, the thought of war had almost disappeared from his mind. Hadn't Hitler promised to respect the neutrality of Holland? The radio hummed and crackled. Then came a voice, a woman's voice, full of outrage and dignity. The Queen! John quickly turned up the volume. Her voice filled the house. 
I hereby raise a flaming protest against this unprecedented violation of all that is right and decent among civilized nations. My government and I will do our duty. You do yours, everywhere and in all circumstances. Everyone at his assigned post, with the utmost vigilance, and with the inner assurance and resolve of a clear conscience. While the Queen was speaking, the others had entered the room quietly. As the national anthem was played, the family sang along. Never before had John been so moved singing that old song. He looked at his mother, pale, with tears in her eyes, and singing bravely. John took her hand, drawing himself up tall, feeling ready to do brave and dangerous deeds. That was beautiful, said Father when the broadcast was over. He almost looked happy. Or was he just putting on a good front? Chins up, he said. Let's plan our strategy. It's almost eight o'clock. If the Germans cross the border at daybreak, we can assume that they'll be here at any time. We're only 40 kilometers from the border, protected by maybe 2,000 troops. Our men will withdraw to the ISIL line, maybe even further. If all the children were here, we'd stay put. There probably won't be much fighting here. But, exactly. Two of the family were in Scheveningen with Aunt Hattie, twelve-year-old Fritz and three-year-old Trudy. Six-year-old Hanukkah was with Aunt Jo near Rotterdam. They'd been farmed out to the family for a few days so that they wouldn't be underfoot during the move. Father would have picked them all up tomorrow. The ISA line will hold them, said Father. If not, then the Grebel line will. Maybe for only a little while, but maybe permanently. And then we would be separated from the others until the end of the war. Shall we try to reach them now? Yes, said Mother. I want to go to the children. Let's go right now, Averett, as soon as possible. All right, said Father. That's what we'll do. Now, everybody listen and do exactly as I say. John, get the car ready. Check everything. Trisha, you fix some sandwiches. We'll eat in the car. Mother, pack only what's absolutely necessary. I'll help you after I get dressed. We've got to be on the road in half an hour. They scattered. John ran to the garage, opened the doors, and started the DKW. After turning the car around, ready for loading, John filled the gas tank from a jerry can in the garage. Then he checked the tires. When he returned to the house to report that the car was ready, the radio announcer was giving warnings about German planes. Planes over Gorkum. Planes over Utrecht. Planes over Rheinsberg. Parachute troops over Wassenaar and Kutwijk. Three planes shot down near Arnhem. John went storming upstairs. Dad! he shouted. Dad! They've already shot down three enemy planes. Father shoved a heavy suitcase into his hand. Put it in the car, he said, and then come back for more. Put a jerry can of gas in the trunk. To get at the trunk, John had to climb into the DKW and fold the back seat forward. Trisha came out carrying a suitcase and a bag of sandwiches. Mother brought coats and jackets and the strong box full of papers and jewelry. Father locked up the house and tossed a portfolio of sketches into the car, his latest project. Then he snapped a chain on Nemo, the dog, and jogged away with him to the neighboring farmhouse. Meanwhile, John packed the trunk, just managing to fit it all in. You going to sit in front, Mum? he asked. She smiled at him. No, she said, you sit with your father. And there was father, ready to go. They eased out of the yard. How peaceful the house looked, the apple trees around it like 
pink bouquets, and the birds chirping and warbling. Did they really have to leave all this behind? Whoa! A high-pitched voice shouted. The car jerked to a stop. A little bow-legged old man stood in the driveway, blocking the way with outstretched arms. His almost toothless mouth broke into a grin as he approached Father's window. A fine one you turned out to be, he said, chuckling. Drop in between eight and nine in the morning, you said, and here I catch you trying to duck out on me. You aren't already running scared from the Germans, are you, Everett? Not running, said Father, but three of our children aren't home yet, Uncle Garrett. We can hardly leave them alone at a time like this, right? When the old man nodded, Father continued, Do me a favor and keep an eye on things here. You were going to work for me. We agreed on that, right? We'll come to an agreement on wages later. I'll give you some money now in case you need something. Who knows when we'll see each other again? But Uncle Garrett refused to take anything. It won't be long, he said, and I've got something put aside. You'll be back soon, don't worry. You'll get to your children, but you won't outrun the Germans. You'll go to bed a Dutchman tonight, and then wake up a German. Have you so little hope, you old cynic? Father asked, shaking his head sadly. Little hope, echoed the old man. No, I've got all kinds of hope. Hitler might conquer half the world, but then his bubble will burst. You can't build on oppression and lies, not as long as there's a God in heaven. Well, you'd better step on it. They're getting closer. Drive safely, and God bless you. He shook Father's hand, curtsied comically to the others, and stood waving and smiling as the car drove off down the road. That was Garrett, my father's hired hand, father explained. You can be sure that he'll take good care of our place while we're gone. He's always full of jokes, but you can count on him. An optimist with a difference, isn't he? Maybe, maybe he's right. Silently, he turned his attention to the road. The DKW leaped ahead, heading south. 